Hello and welcome to another video in this series where we journey from the very simple primes to the foothills of the Riemann hypothesis. Today's video is quite a short one where we'll be taking a look at infinite products. Now in school we do actually spend a lot of time learning about sums and infinite sums and here's an example that we're quite familiar with now. Adding terms and adding infinitely many terms can sometimes result in a sum which is finite and we've already talked about convergence and divergence. If the sum gets larger and larger and larger then we say the sum diverges and if it becomes closer and closer to a finite value then we say it converges. Just a little point about terminology, um, you'll see textbooks and others talking about series and that should be interpreted as meaning sum. Um, it's not immediately obvious and you can kind of look into definitions of terminology. Um, sequences is just a list of terms or numbers or things um, and historically the word series has come to mean sum, so infinite series, infinite sum. Before we proceed on to infinite products, it's worth just looking again at what we really mean by an infinite sum. So far we've had a kind of an intuitive understanding um, and we've tried to avoid too much um, kind of, you know, uh, mathematical rigour because um, the point of these videos is to develop primarily an intuitive understanding and leave the, um, the very fine details to the textbooks. But I think here it's worth looking at what we mean by an infinite sum. And the idea is to say that actually we think about a partial sum from 1 to n, not from 1 to infinity, from 1 to n, and look at what that series, that sum looks like and then ask what happens to that sum as n tends to infinity. So it's slightly different, subtly different. Instead of saying n is infinity, we're saying, well, what happens as n goes to infinity? And the reason that is helpful is because we can sometimes find expressions for the sum and see more clearly what happens to it, its behavior, as n gets larger. Um, and that's that slightly subtle difference in viewpoint, but it can unlock um, an insight. We'll see examples of that, um, so don't worry if that's a bit abstract. We also know that there are lots of tests that we can do for convergence. Um, a very common one is called the ratio test, um, where we compare you know, a term and the term before. And if, um, you know, if the ratio is less than one, we can say it converges, for example. Um, there are other kinds of tests you can do as well. Great, so that's just a refresh on what infinite sums were. And it is useful to do that because then we can compare and contrast and perhaps draw parallels with infinite products. So an infinite product looks similar. You know, there's a lot of um, C, um, terms, elements, and in fact, they go on forever. There's no end. And instead of adding them, we're multiplying them. And that's why it's an infinite product. And this is a symbol in case you haven't seen it before. It looks like a pie. <laughs> so it's natural to ask, what do we mean by an infinite product? Do we mean that the values, the, the products kind of, you know, as we multiply more and more terms, it approaches a finite value? Is that, is that the correct understanding of what an infinite product is? Let's delay answering that and just think through um, a few examples just to get us thinking about what an infinite product might mean. So here's a very simple example. 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 times 6 times 7 and so on. And the numbers get larger by 1. Now. This, I think most people would agree, intuitively um, diverges. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger because the numbers that we are uh, using in the um, sequence uh, 
get larger and larger and therefore the product gets larger and larger. I don't think there's any controversy about that. Um, so that's, that's a good starting point. Something that's not so trivial is this example here. Now each of these terms is less than one, which means multiplying by something less than one between zero and one makes it smaller. So a fraction times a fraction times a fraction times a fraction means you get smaller and smaller. Um, but actually each of these terms itself are getting larger than the previous one. Hmm, something to think about there. Does this converge? Hmm. So our previous notion with the sums that the terms get smaller and smaller might not apply here because we're still getting a shrinking effect by multiplying by a factor that's less than one. Definitely something to think about. Let's do some more thinking. Here we've got um, again another infinite product and this time we're starting at say minus two. I could have started at minus four, doesn't really, doesn't, or even minus three, doesn't really matter. The idea is that there are infinitely many terms, one times two times three times four times five times six, and we can see that it would get bigger and bigger and bigger and we would probably say that it diverged except there's a zero. So zero times something is zero, is that right? Hmm. That's definitely worth thinking about. I don't think the answer's that trivial. Another interesting thing to think about is, well, if we remove that zero, we crossed it out and had a different infinite product that excluded zero, would this then diverge? I think we would say it did. So is a zero, if removing a zero, is that enough to cause a divergent product to turn into um, something with a finite value of zero? That's an interesting thing about, can we, so for example, if we had a sum and we added and it was divergent and we added or subtracted a finite value that's not enough to turn it from a divergent sum into a convergent sum. The question we're asking here is, by removing an element, is that enough to turn a divergent product into something with a finite value of zero here? Interesting questions. Um, yeah. Let's go back to um, um, the definition of an infinite product. And again, we're following the same idea of saying, let's first define it for a finite series, finite sequence of terms from one to n, and look at what the product looks like, not the sum, the product this time, and then ask what happens as n gets closer and closer to infinity, larger and larger, is there some insight we can get by looking at the form of P, which tells us whether it gets ever larger or, or, or approaches another value? That's, that seems to be a useful and parallel um, definition. The actual definition is that this converges if P is not just finite, but is also non-zero. That's different from the definition for sums where we just said it has to be a finite value. Here we're saying it has to be finite and non-zero. Hmm, that is, that is different and something to kind of ponder on. In fact, the convention is that if the product, the infinite product is zero, we say the infinite product diverges to zero, not converges, but diverges. That might sound counterintuitive. We'll dig into why that is in a minute. So why do we say um, P has to be non-zero? Why do we have to, why do we have this term diverges to zero, which, which really sounds like it shouldn't make sense at all? Well, 
the convention that's grown up around infinite products is to look at them through the lens of a logarithm. So you know how taking the logarithm of a product turns it into a sum. Let's, let's write that down. So we know that the logarithm of a times b is the logarithm of a plus the logarithm of b. And if we had the logarithm of a, b, c, that's the logarithm of a plus the logarithm of b plus the logarithm of c. So if we had a product of terms a, n, if we took the log, that would become the sum of the logarithm of those terms over n. So the logarithm of zero is not defined. As values get close to zero, the logarithm gets closer to minus infinity. It gets larger and larger negatively. So you can see if the product, this product here, gets closer to a zero, the log gets closer to minus infinity or undefined. And that's why we say it diverges to zero. Let's look at a few examples. This is a, a nice one. Does this infinite product converge? The infinite product of one plus one over n. And before we dive in, let's just look at the nature of this thing. One, if we didn't have the one over n, it, we just had one, it would just be a product of ones, one times one times one times one, which converges to one. If we have one over n, we're adding a little bit. So each of these terms, each of the factors in this product is a little bit more than one. And as n gets larger, that little bit extra is smaller and smaller. So when n is two, it's one and a half. When n is three, it's one and a third. So we are multiplying terms that are more than one, but they are getting smaller and smaller towards one. Hmm. What do we think? Does that converge? Well, let's write it out. Often when you're attacking these kinds of questions, it's worth writing out a first few terms to see if you can spot a pattern. And we can, if we rewrite one plus one over n as n plus one over n, it's a very simple thing to do. And then write out a few terms. You can see there's a pattern. Two over one times three over two times four over three times five over four. And the general term is n plus one over n. And we can cancel in a systematic way. That two cancels that two, that three cancels that three, that four cancels that four, all the way along, which leaves n plus one over one, which is just n plus one. So for whatever n we have, the product will be n plus one. And as n gets larger, n plus one diverges to infinity. So we can say that this product, this infinite product, diverges. Let's look at another example where instead of a plus, which makes each factor a little bit more than one, let's make it less than. So we're doing a minus here. We're just adjusting this starting point because if we started from one, it would be one minus one, which would make zero and we want to avoid that. So again, let's write out um, the first few terms and see if we can spot a pattern. So we can rewrite that one minus one over n as a neater fraction, n minus one over n and write out the first few terms, one over two, two over three, three over four, and so on. And you notice that we can cancel again in a very systematic way. Twos cancel, threes cancel, fours cancel, and so on, leaving one over n, whatever n is. Now, as n gets larger and larger towards infinity, this one over n gets smaller towards zero. That kind of makes sense because 
overall, this 1 minus 1 over n is less than 1, so it's a fraction times a fraction times a fraction. So the project goes towards 0, but remember we say it diverges to 0. One more thing that I think we will look at today is a um, convergence test, um, and it's quite commonly used in number theory, so we will look at it here. It's not very complicated, despite what that page looks like. And we'll talk through it. It's actually not very difficult at all, um, but it's very useful and, and it's worth knowing about. So, if we wrote those terms as 1 plus a to the n, just a rewriting, um, where a n is always more than 0, if that's possible, then we can um, make use of this convergence test, potentially. So if we write the if we can write the terms as one plus a over n, and remember in the previous ones we could, then we can write an inequality. And the reason we can do that is by referring to the Taylor series for e to the x, which is one plus x plus x squared over two factorial plus x cubed over three factorial and so on and so on. If we only take the first two terms, 1 plus x, it means that 1 plus x is less than the exponential because we've chopped it off. So 1 plus x is less than the exponential. 1 plus a to the n is less than the exponential of a to the n. Now this thing can be rewritten as the exponential of the sum of those terms. Let's see why that's the case. If we say e to the x times e to the y, that's the same as e to the x plus y. If we say e to the x times e to the y times e to the z, that's the same as e to the x plus y plus z. So that means we can say e, if there's a product of e to the an a n, that's the same as e to the sum of a n. That's what we're using at this step from here to here. So this is a crucial point. If this sum, this infinite sum of those a n terms converges, because it is more than or equal to this term, this product here, if this converges, then this converges. Not the other way around, because we haven't shown it to be true with the inequality the other way. So. It, so if this converges, because it is more than or equal to this, then this also converges. So we, what this means is that in order to determine whether a infinite product converges, we can sometimes look at the infinite sum to see if that converges, and we're quite practiced in doing that. So let's summarize this important result. If the infinite sum of a to the n converges, then we can say that the infinite product of 1 plus a to the n converges as long as a n is more than zero. Not the other way around, this arrow is not bidirectional. Let's apply that. Does this converge? 1 plus 1 over n squared, the infinite product of that? Well, we look at the a n term, which is 1 over n squared, and ask, does the infinite sum the Basel problem, does that converge? And we know it does. Can I just apply squared over 6? We've seen that in a previous video. So yes, the product converges because this sum converges. Fantastic. That was um, not too difficult at all. I think overall, um, I, I'm not really sure why infinite products aren't really taught in schools. They're not that complicated. Um, but it's worth covering because there is a little bit of um, a counterintuitive point there which is the convention around diverging to zero. That's the only thing really that stands out from um, anything else, you know, which pretty much follows what you'd expect. I hope that was useful. See you next time. Bye.